This is Lesson 3 in the series, Why Not Be Rich? And it is entitled, To Have or Have Not. Join us now for our lesson and our powerful, prospering declarations. I quickly release all mental limitations, negative emotions, and physical accumulations that keep my good from me. I activate the free flow of my good now. Good. Number eight, I release and let go. Together. I release and I let go. I am open to God's flow. I dare to prosper now. When? Now. Good. And we've added a few new ones for this week <clears throat> that we'll be speaking. We'll be speaking these now. Through the power of our spoken word, we begin to create our abundance. So we begin with, I work miracles together. I work miracles as I speak words of increase and abundance. Wait a minute, I just noticed. I left out an I there. Okay, so let's, let's do that one again. I work miracles as I speak words of increase and abundance. Now number 13. My constructive, uplifting, fulfilling words prosper me now. And finally, I am prospering. Together, I am prospering. I am prospering now. My rich thoughts prosper me now. Again, I am prospering. I am prospering now. My rich thoughts prosper me now. Once more. I am prospering, I am prospering now. My rich thoughts prosper me now. When? Now. When? Now. When? Now. Good. Okay. <clears throat> we are prepared for that superabundance of spirit that is ours by divine right. When we, pre when we prepare ourselves for this. In our progress toward experiencing the prosperity and the prosperous, prosperous life that is ours by divine right, we have been discovering that we have to begin to expect prosperity, that we have to begin to build a prosperity consciousness. And we're learning some methods of how we can build that prosperity consciousness so that we can attain a free flow of God's good in our life. We learned last week that we have to clean up, clean out all of those physical, mental, and emotional accumulations that we have gathered through the years. That we have to do not only an outer cleansing, that is cleansing cleaning out the drawers, cleaning out the closets, cleaning out the attic, which is much like our mind, and the uh, basement, which is much like our subconscious, the garage, which represents that area of freedom of expression, that we need to clean those out, but we also need to get rid of those old emotional states of mind, which are really tied in very closely without all of that outer physical accumulation. We need to let go of old fears, old concepts, all of those things which are blocking the flow of spirit within us. We need to begin to build attitudes that expect the good in our life, that we expect a miracle of abundance to come forth in our life. We're ready for it. We're ready now. We've done our cleansing. We are ready to expect a miracle of good in our lives. When my daughter was just a wee tot, she had an experience which I'm sure brought to her the superabundance which she didn't expect in her life. We had gone shopping one day, and when we returned from shopping, I had put most of the things away, but I had set a few of the things on the table. Now, at that time, she was just barely tall enough so that she could just barely reach up over the edge of the table just to touch things that were up there. And I left the room, and when I came back, there she was sitting on the floor. Now what she had managed to do 
Well, she had managed to reach up on that table and some way or another pulled off a Martha Washington cream pie. <laughs> she had managed to get the box open and she was sitting there on the floor stuffing pie you know, into her mouth just as fast as she could. And when she saw me, she looked up with those great big blue eyes of hers and she said, I'm God's perfect child. <laughs> she had learned the magic words very early that got her out of trouble. You know? And we have learned a lot of words in our life which seem like magic because they get us in to a lot of trouble sometimes and they also can get us out of a lot of trouble because our words definitely determine whether we have something or whether we have not. Whether we have or whether we have not. Because our words are the tools, the instruments by which we build our world. We shape and form our world according to our thought word. Just as in the beginning, the whole universe, the whole cosmos, everything that was and is in pure potential was formed by creative spirit, God, so too do we form everything out of that invisible realm of spirit and bring it forth into manifestation through the power of our thought word. We understand the law, and the law is as in mind, so in manifestation, as in heaven, so in earth, and that we are building our world through the power of our thought word. Whenever we think a thought, we shape it and form it into a word, a word, and I think a lot of people don't realize this. I think they think that, oh, I can just think all of these thoughts I want to, and they're not going to accomplish anything. But every word that we think is formative. Now, some of them are more formative than others because we invest more feeling in them. We invest more energy in them. And the more energy or feeling that we invest in a thought, the more rapidly it manifests in our world. So it's very important to realize that every thought is formative, some thoughts more than others because we invest more of that living energy of spirit in them and they come forth more rapidly into a manifestation in our world. We find out what we are manifesting in our world by listening to our words. Now, we don't just listen to the words that we're speaking audibly, although that's very important, because we are speaking a lot of words audibly which are not constructive. We speak a lot of words that say, Oh, I don't have time to do that. I don't have time to accomplish what I need to accomplish. I don't have the strength. I don't have the strength to go on. I don't have the strength to be and do what I want to be. I don't have the energy. Golly, I'm just worn out. I'm just dragging around. I don't have enough strength or energy to go on. How many times do we hear ourselves saying that? Are, well, I don't have the money to do that. I don't have the money to do that. I can't do that because I don't have. I don't have the knowledge. I don't have the background. I don't have, I don't have, I don't have. And you know what? You don't have. <laughs> the words that we speak are formative. Now, I'm not talking about being Pollyanna and saying that we have something when we don't have it. But what we have to begin to do is recognize that we do have abundance now. We do have abundance now. We do have a manifestation of good in our life now. But we can have more. We can have more. So we need to begin to form an attitude that says, I have. I have this, but I am going to have more. Do you see the difference? Because we often center in and uh, focalize in on the idea of the have-nots, the have-nots. We tend to center all of our energy on have-nots, and have-nots are nothing 
but empty holes into which you can keep pouring all of the thought energy of your mind, and it will never be filled because it's a bottomless pit. It's a bottomless pit. So what you really need to do is work with the idea of the abundance that you have now. One penny can be abundance. One penny can be abundance because it's good. If you look at that penny and see behind it the idea of in God we trust. In God we trust. So you begin right where you are with the idea of the abundance that you have and you begin to speak words of having plenty. Having plenty of time to accomplish, to be, and to do everything I need to do. Having all of the strength and the energy within me, the potential for experiencing and expressing wholeness of mind, wholeness of body, strength, energy to do and to be. Knowing that money, I think Ernest Wilson was one who said this a long time ago. He says, you know, money is the easiest thing in the world to manifest. And a lot of people would say, what do you mean it's the easiest thing in the world to manifest? It really is. It really is. Because there is a superabundance of money in the universe. There is a superabundance of money in the universe, and we can manifest it by attuning our thought to it. But there are other things such as health, such as peace of mind, and things like that, that and harmonious human relationships that take a little bit more work. You know, you can always manifest money, but some of these other things take a little bit more work because they have come forth out of an accumulation of thoughts and feelings which are manifesting in our world and which are pretty hard to give up, which are pretty hard for us to give up, pretty hard for us to eliminate and to let go. But we can do it because we have been given dominion dominion over the thoughts that we will hold in our mind and no one else, no one else can determine the thoughts that we hold in our mind unless we choose to accept those thoughts that others impose upon us. We need to remember that the thought word is the seed that we plant in the rich soil of substance that brings forth after its kind in manifestation. Remembering the law, as in mind, so in manifestation, as in heaven, so in earth. Our words, as Charles Fillmore so aptly brought out the idea, are our power to transfer substance from one plane to another. Substance is invisible, radiant mind essence invisible, radiant mind essence. It is that out of which everything that has come forth in the universe has come forth. We shape and form that substance according to our thought word. So we see it as a seed, and we see our ability to transfer this invisible mind essence, which is so rich, which is so abundant, which is so omnipresent, from one plane to another. And we're doing it all the time. We are doing it mostly on an unconscious level. We continue to shape and form that substance in limited or negative ways. We continue to shape that substance in ways in which are not productive to our good. And you think, well, that may be well and good for somebody who really knows, but how do I know that I have all of this substance? Well, you brought it with you. You brought it with you. You brought it with you because all substance exists in the Christ. And the Christ is individualized in each and every individual as the image likeness of God and as the reality. It is what you have been using and what you have been expressing all along according to your understanding use, according to the way you've been using it. So if you think about your children sometimes and you think about them and say, well, gee, I have to be the channel for their supply. Yes, you can be a channel for their supply, but you're not the only one because those children brought with them their own substance, their own Christ and they have the ability to bring forth through them when we 
let them understand that principle, the good that they need in their lives. Prosperity is spiritual. That was the way we opened this morning. Prosperity is spiritual, and spirituality prospers. Because the more spiritual we are, the more we are in tune with this radiant substance of spirit of the Christ, and the more we bring forth or radiate forth in our life, not necessarily as an accumulation of things, but as an instant, constant, and abundant supply of everything to meet every need at the time we need it. It's always there when we need it. We can draw forth this infinite substance from within us. Just as spirituality prospers and prosperity is spiritual, so too is poverty a sin. This is what Charles Fillmore said. Poverty is a sin. Poverty means that we are falling short of the mark of perfection, that we are not using our God-given inheritance that we are not shaping and forming this infinite radiant substance in beautiful, wonderful, prospering ways, that we are not using our divine inheritance from a loving Father. You know, we all need to become aware of prosperity and how we have been prospering, how we have been using our word to form our world. You know, if we take a look at the ways that we have been prospering, then perhaps we can find the way that we can increase our prosperity in the future. All of us have prospered in one way or another in many ways, but we often forget, we often forget just how we have prospered in the past because we are so caught up in the need of now. We're so involved in whatever it is that's drawing our attention now that we forget that we have prospered in the past. I found myself in just such a position one time. I was talking to a dear friend of mine, and this friend was always talking prosperity. And I didn't talk prosperity very much. I was always very involved in what I was doing, and I didn't talk very much about prosperity until we sat down and we began to talk. And she began to tell me about some of the prosperity experiences that she had had in her life, and I began to talk to her, and I began to unfold some of the things that had happened in my life, and they were just kind of flowing out as one thing came to mind, another thing came to mind, and another, and on down the line, and she just sat there, and she looked at me, and she says, wow, she said, you really ought to write a book or something on prosperity, because you really have developed a prosperity consciousness. Now, right at that moment, I had a need in my life. And I had become so involved with that need that I had forgotten about all the times in my life that I had prospered. But I began to think about that. Now, well, I have prospered in these ways. And the way that I find out how I have prospered is by taking a look. Taking a look at each of those ways that I have prospered and then beginning to put them into operation in my life. Now, each of you have been given this morning an orange card, which I'm going to ask you to use later in your own private time to unfold the idea of demonstrations in your life. But I'm going to talk to you just for a few minutes about how I worked demonstrations, and then you can see exactly what it is that you have done in your life. Remember that things don't happen to you they happen through you. That every demonstration that you have made in your life has come to you by right of consciousness. It just didn't happen. It just didn't happen. It happened to you, through you, because you had established the mental equivalent, the mental equivalent for whatever was manifest in your world. It is yours by right of consciousness. The mental attitudes that you formed the creative actions that you took, everything that you did, following the guidance, opening your mind, being and doing, are the things that brought about prosperity in your life. And when you think about prosperity, always remember what we started off in this course with, that prosperity does mean financial prosperity, but it also means health of body. 
It also means peace of mind. It also means harmonious relationships and happiness in filling in and through your life. So when you begin to think about the things that have prospered you, you'll find many of those things are not just financial things, but are things which are what we call those intangibles, and some of them even not intangibles. I listed six things which I found were demonstrations in my life, and I listed more than that, but I came to these six things that I felt were probably the most important prosperity demonstrations that I had made. The very first one was graduation and ordination at Unity School. And you know, all the time that I was working through this activity of becoming a Unity minister, I really had to draw upon a particular quality within me. So I'd like for you to think about the qualities that enter into each of the experiences of your life. But in this one particular life experience, the one that was important to me was faith, was faith. I had to activate all of the faith that I had to bring forth this desire, to bring forth this desire to become a unity minister. All the time I was here, I had to invest all of this living energy, this substance, in this one idea, in this one idea, and I had to know that all the time that I was working in and through this, that God was in charge of my life, that God was in charge of my life, and many a time that I spoke that word, that God was in charge of my life. You know, I think we all have a desire, this was a desire of mine, to be have the right companion, the right companion in my life. So I was seeking my right and perfect mate. I was affirming and desiring my right and perfect mate. I began to affirm this, that my right and perfect mate, the one that was mine by divine right, was coming to me quickly and peacefully. You know, you don't want somebody that's going to come really like a roaring lion. You want somebody that's going to come with all of this type of activity that is peaceful. And so I drew to me, through me, by right of consciousness, Frank Judice. I can remember talking to Leo Russell uh, at the time, and I was saying, Leo, how do you draw your right and perfect mate to you? And Leo said, well, you begin to know that you have a divine mate. One is that is yours by right of consciousness, and as you begin to affirm that, that person will move to you in time and space. And sure enough, about the time that I began to affirm this, Frank Judice started moving toward me in time and space. We compared notes and later found out that at the exact time that I began to affirm this, he too was reaching out for his right and perfect mate, and we came together by divine appointment. So, when you have that activity, you need to activate the faculty of love, love. You have to be willing to open yourself to love, to give love, and to receive love. And you know, a lot of times we think we want something, but we're not really willing to open ourselves to love. We're not really willing to give. And the other side of the coin is that we're really not willing to receive. The next experience that I listed as a demonstration that was very important in my life was a healing of my body. I had experienced a physical uh, dis-ease, disease that had manifested after many, many years of, well, I don't know, I, I really was never an unhealthy person. When I was a kid, I had a lot of uh, childhood illnesses, but I was never really ill, and yet, one time, when I thought I was really doing everything right, I found myself flat on my back, flat on my back with, a, uh, with an illness that had really uh, laid me out. And then when I saw this idea of healing that really could be worked, I thought, wow, what is it that needs healing in me? Because I have a manifestation in my body of pain, of real pain. And I need to have a healing. I need to have a healing. So what is happening? So as I lay there 
and I was thinking about this activity, I became aware that something was blocking the flow of energy in my body. And when I became aware of that, I became aware of the fact that there was a lot of things in my life that needed this activity. And that activity was forgiveness. Forgiveness. Because there's nothing like the lack of forgiveness of self and others that will block the flow of spirit within you. So first of all, I began to forgive myself, just as Myrtle Fillmore did, for holding all of these thoughts which were blocking the flow of spirit. And then I began to forgive others for the offenses that I felt that they had done toward me in life, and then I forgave myself for all of the things that ha I had done to offend others. And through this process, I experienced my healing because I followed it up with that quality which always have to follow forgiveness, love. I began to pour love into this part of my body temple and everything was dissolved, everything was released, and I experienced a total healing. The next thing that I worked with on a demonstration was buying my first car. Now that may not sound uh, like a lot to a lot of you, but some of you, you may be identifying with this. But I remembered this incident of wanting to buy my first car. I had a real need for a car at that particular time. I had had uh, family cars when I was younger, and I hadn't driven for many, many years, because when I first started to learn to drive, I was going down through a park with this friend of mine who was teaching me how to drive, a driving instructor, and as I was going through this park, I came around a curve, and here was a 10-ton truck coming around the other way, and he was in the middle of the road, and there was no way I could miss him. But I managed to sideswipe him and went off through the woods without hitting a tree, came back on on the road, and all I had done was managed to sideswipe the, uh, the truck and laid that back fender flat. Well, that was all right. It scared the liver out of me. But my dad, whose car it was, was not very loving about that flattened out fender. And so between the fear that I had experienced then and the reaction of my father, I didn't drive for many, many years. I didn't drive for many years, but I decided that I really needed a car and I really needed to drive. So I began to do what? Did I just run down to the nearest place and buy a car? No, you don't do that. You get ready. You get ready for that car. You begin to open yourself to that car. And I began to look around at all the types of cars that were available. I began to look at the used car lots. I began to look at new car lots. I began to look everywhere until I all of a sudden had a really good idea of what it was that I really wanted. As a matter of fact, every morning going to work and to, from work, I rode in a car like I wanted. And this was a Valiant, was the very first one that they made in 1970, 60, excuse me, 1960 Valiant. And I thought, well, gee, this is a really nice car. And so I went around and looked at all the used car lots for that type of a car. And uh, one morning on the way to work, after I had been affirming and knowing that the right car at the right price was going to come to me, this, I told the driver, this, a man that I worked with, I said, I'm looking for a car. And he says, oh, you are? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, well, uh, what kind of a car do you want? And I said, well, I'd really like something like this one. You know, this is really a nice car, and I've been looking at cars like this. And he says, you really interested in this car? And I said, yeah. And he says, well, I'll sell it to you. He says, I'm going to be moving, and I need a truck rather than a car. And he says, so I'm getting ready to sell this car. And he gave me a price. And that price was far below every one that I had looked at on the lot. And not only that, this man was a super top mechanic, and that car was in A1 condition. So I was able to buy the car at the right price, at the right time, with everything that I wanted on it. Because I knew that I had a desire, and you have to have a desire or a need, a need and a desire to get that which you want in your life. Another thing that I found in my life that was very important was finding the right position. Before I came to, uh, into the ministry, I was a statistician. 
uh, specializing in workload coordination and control and things like that. And so I began to know that as I was seeking this one position in Long Beach, California, that my position was seeking me. Just as I was seeking that position, my position was seeking me. So begin to know that. And as I did that and followed the guidance within me, I love to tell the story of taking a bus out to Terminal Island, <clears throat> riding on the bus, and headed for the Long Beach Naval Air Station, because I had decided I was going to work for the Navy and for the, air, for the air station. But as I was going along, I saw the sign Employment Office. I saw the sign Employment Office with an arrow, and so I thought, oh, I've missed my stop. And I went on down to the end of the run and came back and got off by the employment office, found myself in the Long Beach Naval Shipyard. It wasn't the air station, but I decided since I was there, I would put my application in. And do you know that there were three positions for which I was uniquely qualified waiting? And I had my choice. I had my choice of one of the three because I knew that in finding this position that I was totally prepared. I was totally prepared. I had gotten my mind, my abilities, everything together so that when I was seeking that position, that position was really seeking me. As I followed my guidance, my guidance led me to the right place. You know, we all like to win something. One time, <clears throat> I won some giftware. I won some giftware. Now, I know all of us have liked to win things like that, and I've won quite a few things in my life. I've always been very, quote, lucky, because I have always established a consciousness for this. That, but one of the things that I have found out about winning is that you need to have persistence. You need to have persistence. But you also have to have that winning feeling. You have to have that winning feeling. Because when I was listening to this radio program, and I listened to it often, and they were always giving away prizes, I began to get this winning feeling. I began to feel, hey, you know, I can win this. I know how to win this. I know how to do these things. I know how to uh, win. And so I persisted, persisted. And this, when I persisted this one evening, wow, the phone got through. They answered the other end of the thing, and guess who had the answer? Me. So I got the, <clears throat> and believe you me, the people that had been getting through before me did not know the answer. So it was one of those things where I was prepared. I was prepared to get the giftware, and I did. You know, <clears throat> we need to write out, and you can use your orange cards at your own time and at your own leisure, to write out what you, how you have prospered in the past, to begin to check out what was the major quality that you needed to bring forth that manifestation. Then you need to write out a desire. You can write out, first of all, across the top, the ways that you have demonstrated. And then you can show what qualities were necessary in that. But then at the bottom, remember, we all have desires. We all have desires that we want to manifest in our life. So use the space at the bottom to write out the desires that you have that you want to see fulfilled in your life. Write out the quality that you know will bring them forth, and then begin to work on them. The first thing you need to do is to get yourself an affirmation. Now, for each and every one of these manifestations in my life, I had an affirmation that I found myself using. For the graduation and ordination, God is in charge of my life. For the marriage to Frank, my perfect mate, mine by divine right, comes to me quickly, peacefully. And he did. For the healing, I forgive, let go, and let love heal me now. For my transportation, my perfect transportation at the right price my perfect transportation at the right price. Then for that position, my right position seeks me as I seek it. My right position seeks me as I seek it. And then for winning, I have that winning feeling. I can win. 
I have that winning feeling, I can win. These are the types of affirm affirmative thoughts that we need to build into our consciousness. We need to write out what we want. We need to write out what we want and not what we think we ought to have. That's very important. We need to dare to want the highest and the best in our life. We need to be definite about what we want. We don't want to be influenced by others because if we're not definite, then others will influence what we want in our life. So we need to know what we want and to be definite about it. We need to keep our desires secret. We need to keep them secret because if we do not, then others will pour cold water on them. We need to desire good. We need to desire good and to be open and receptive to the good that God has prepared for us. Because as we keep it secret, then our Father who heareth in secret shall reward us openly with the good that we desire in our life. Remember, we have or have not according to our thought word. So we need to choose our words carefully. We need to choose those positive, uplifting, fulfilling words that will bring our good to us. We need to water those seed words with thanks, with blessing. Bless them. Give thanks for them. We need to see them multiplying through our words of praise, through our words of appreciation. Begin to appreciate the good that you have and begin to appreciate the good that is forthcoming in your life. Then when you do that, you will know the truth that the superabundance of spirit is mine in mind and manifestation now. The superabundance of spirit is mine in mind and manifestation now. Together, the superabundance of spirit is mine in mind and manifestation now again. The superabundance of spirit is mine in mind and manifestation now. Once more, the superabundance of spirit is mine in mind and manifestation now. When? Now. When? Now. When? Now. Okay, good.